This is a presentation on completing the Authority Pro Forma tool for this year. Um, it's got Andy Humphreys, uh, myself, and, and Bill Baxter down, and Andy's on leave today, so it's me that's presenting, uh, and Bill's online as well um, to answer any queries. So, uh, as ever, every year we release the APT for completion in the middle of December. We don't have a fixed date at the moment, and we don't tend to have a fixed date and say it's definitely coming out on this day because before we can send the APT out, we have to we rely on collecting and processing a whole lot of census data, which isn't finalised until the very end of November. So we receive it usually roughly around 3rd or 4th of December, and then we have to process it a bit more before we can populate all your individual APTs and then get them out to you. So we haven't got a specific date where we say it's definitely coming out on this date. Usually, usually we've managed to get it out in the past few years around the 10th, 11th of December. Um, a bit before um, you actually get your DSG announcement of how much money you've got. Um, and we do that because it, there's still things you can usefully do when looking at your APT to make a start before you even know how much money you've been allocated um, and need to, 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 to allocate through the, through the APT. And the things you can do with the, relating to your school estate, checking the data, having a look at some of the, the schools, making sure that they're, they're, they're actually expect uh, and things like that. So they can all make a start on that before you even know the DSG, which will hopefully come out a little bit after we, we send out the APT. OK, and as every year, we obviously we produce uh, quite a comprehensive document on how to complete the authority pro forma tool. And there's a link here to that. Now, we will share these slides afterwards, so obviously the link will become relevant to you then. Um, but at the moment, it links to last year's version because we, we don't publish the new how to complete uh, guidance until we send out the new APT. So uh, that, that link will, will go to the landing page, but at the moment it's, it's last year's documentation. So during this session, we will look at what we do and how we process your APTs um, and some of the reasons why we ask for some resubmissions. And then finally, at the end, hopefully we'll have time to give you a chance to raise any issues you've already thought of um, and any, 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 and hopefully offer you some resolution to those issues. The, 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 the point being that hopefully some time spent now should help reduce turnaround times later and also hopefully reduce any need for resubmissions. The process itself, in the very top there on the, on the, the left hand corner is, is a one box which summarizes everything we ask you to do. APT sent out to LAs. Um, oh no, sorry, that's that's the moment it all starts. The, the APT gets sent out to you is the next box. LAs amend APT, and that summarizes everything you do in that one box there. Um, it, each of these boxes isn't intended to show relative size of how much work is involved, um, but it just is it, it's the, the flows there, the flow charts there to show you guys how how what we then do with it and why and why sometimes it, it takes a bit longer for us to deal with it and then we get back to you about it than you might have thought. So after you've sent your APT into us uh, via the portal, um, we then download that file and remove the passwords that you've got. Um, we then run a whole series of validation checks. Uh, now validation checks are checks on whether the APT you've you sent back to us whether whether it's almost almost really whether it's broken or whether there's some things in it that just they're, they're just not accepted at all, um, and therefore there's no thought, or there's no point in us processing the APT any further. So if those validation checks are passed, then it goes on to the, the blue section um, where we then go into a different level of quality assurance. But if those those validation checks are failed at that point, um, then we will generate an email which will then send back to you to point out some of the bits that need changing already uh, immediately. Um, and then we'd ask you to resubmit, which is why the flowchart goes back into that, that loop at the top. So if those validation checks are passed, we then get onto a different section of checking, which um, is more about checking the detail of your specific uh, APT and perhaps specific changes you've made and whether they have been allowed, whether a change you've made that requires a disapplication does actually have that disapplication uh, and things like that. Um, but that can't get done automatically. Um, and we then allocate your APT to different teams, different QA teams, have got different LAs allocated to them, and they'll look more closely at your APT. Um, and the members of those teams can complete these, what we call compliance checks, 
of whether whether everything in the APT is, is OK or not. Um, and again, we then get to the decision point. If those compliance checks are not completely passed, or perhaps they raise a question with us, so, so they might be passed, but we, we actually want to query something about them first, we will then email you back again. And if they've been failed, if those checks have been failed, then we'll be asking you to resubmit to correct the, the correct points we, we identify and ask you to resubmit the APT and then it'll start again the whole process up there. If those compliance checks get passed, we then it, your APT goes into a big pot of all the APTs that have been passed and goes through something called, we call a sense check panel. And that's essentially where we look at all the APTs that we've got <clears throat> and, and we're looking at different choices and decisions you've made and seeing if there's any any that sort of stand out. Um, not necessarily breaking any rules for standing out, but they just happen to stand out. So maybe some, there's an outlier somewhere. You, somebody's used a value in, in, in one of the uh, factors, to funding one of the factors that, that seems very out of kilter with everybody else's, but isn't against the rules. Um, we will check that. And then it, if, if it raises a question with us, we go back to you and ask. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of asking, are you sure that's what you wanted to do? Uh, every other every other LA has done something very different and, and you should. And they ask, well, yes, we know that. And they want to do it this way because such and such. But it gives, just gives us an opportunity to check if there's something that looks uh, out, out of kilter with all the others. But that's why it has to be in a sort of separate section because we have to have a whole bunch of uh, a, a, APTs that have already been passed the other areas before we can compare them with each other. And then finally, once all those different levels of checks are passed and there's nothing, no questions left after we send the check panel, it will be signed off and we will send you a notification that we think your APT is fine. So that's the whole process at our end, uh, summed up in a, a nice flow chart there. Common issues we get. Um, so currently within all those checks I've just been talking about, there are over 40 compliance checks and 20 reasonableness checks uh, and, and then 50 plus validation checks within the APT itself. So some validation checks are actually within the APT as well as ones that we check automatically when you send them in. Um, but I'll come to those in a moment. Um, and there are several regular areas where checks are failed. So some of the simple validation checks get failed. New and growing schools, we often find problems there. Um, some of the inputs and adjustment changes, not, not quite filled in correctly. Um, changes to pupil numbers, and then high needs pupil numbers and political ratification dates. These are common areas. They don't by no means the only areas where some issues arise, but they seem to be common areas. So we're going to touch on some of those in a little bit. So some of the simple validation checks that, 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 that cause problems. Um, the very first one is we won't accept an APT which has got links to external files. So if in one of the cells or one of the schools or, or, or one of the factors, you want to link to, to the, directly to the data to give it a formula in that cell instead of a value, um, you can link within your APT, so you could put a formula in that links directly to the school's got data, which is within the APT. But if you're linking to one of your own local spreadsheets that you keep for, for information that you want to use in, in the APT, but it's external to the APT itself, we won't accept that APT because from our end, obviously your source is, is not something we have access to, so we can't we can't be sure that somebody else doesn't change in that other source. That doesn't mean you can't use that other source. It just means before you submit your APT, you must move that link from that any formula. Um, and the easiest way to do that is, is to go onto the data, uh, what do they call them, the ribbon, the data ribbon, they like to call it, uh, Excel, uh, Microsoft likes to call it. Um, and on there, you'll, you'll see as highlighted here, there's, there's an option for editing links. Um, now, in this particular example, it's light gray, which means there aren't any. But if there are some links, it will be bold. Um, and it's only links to external files. So any links within the, the APT itself won't show up on this. And if you do have links, uh, it'll, you can click on that and it'll, sh it'll show you where they are. Um, if you are happy that you know what those links are <clears throat> and you, you want whatever they're referring to, the information to be there, so you just want to be able to submit your, your APT, you can break those links at that point. Um, and if you break those links at that point, what Excel will do is replace those formulae with a value the correct value from your from your calculation so that link won't exist anymore and it will do that automatically for you when you, when you at that point if you choose to break all those links it won't go um, it's worth checking what those links are and first and make sure that's what you want it to do 
Um, but if you're certain that is what you wanted to do, then in order to be able to submit it, you can break those links at that point and the XM will replace links with, with values for those cells. Um, there's a validation sheet at the end. So the, the far right tab within the APT is a validation sheet. Um, and we try to present that validation sheet as a kind of top down approach um, to flag up where there might be some issues. And, and these will be issues which we, we've managed to find, we've managed to check for within the APT automatically and have therefore flagged them up as red if it fails so that you can then evaluate them yourselves within your APT and, and correct where necessary. And the sort of top down thing I'm referring to is that you'll get that, as you can see here, the very top check sheet there says overall spreadsheet check fail. And that's like a hierarchical thing. So if there's any failure below, then that will be read. But then the next level, it, it breaks it down into different sheets where you might have a failure or not and flags up what that failure is. And then there's a further level of validations further down, which, which, which refers to um, different parts of the APT where you might find a specific failure. Now, hopefully you'll have noticed if you've, been, if you've looked at the summer version of your APT already, um, there's, we, we try to include as much commentary as we can all over the APT, um, as indicated by the little red uh, triangles in the corners of cells. So whenever you hover over those, there'll be more information provided. So in this case, um, we've listed the different uh, validation checks that, that, that are there, and then there's failures or passes against them. And if you want a bit more information about what that validation check is, if you hovered over that, that cell and that triangle, it would come up with a bit more of an explanation and hopefully enable you to correct um, whatever the problem was yourself before submitting your APT. So if, if an APT comes in with, with links, we will basically write straight back to you and say we can't accept it with links. We won't make that change ourselves because it needs to be made by you. Um, and if it comes in with validation errors, again, we will we will send it back to you then. Um, we won't attempt, with the, if there's red flag validation errors here, we won't attempt to understand before you at, at that point. Um, we will just note that it's coming with failures flagged, so you need to correct them. If you're really struggling, you don't understand why those failures have occurred, then please do obviously email us um, and, and, and we will try and explain it for you and help you through it. But at this stage, if it just comes into it, we haven't had any contact from you then we will, we will basically send it straight back. So now when you've got your APT, we, we've tried to sort of think about it in terms of the flow for filling your APT and in terms of moving from left on the APT, the sheets and the tabs to, to, to right as you go for completion. So um, one of the first things you'll notice is most of the data is, is up front on the left hand side in, in the yellow tabs. Um, you've got all the scores block data there, but you've also got the new free scores listed there and some high needs information listed there as well. And one of the first things we ask you to consider doing is to review your data and consider are these scores I'm expecting? Um, are there all my scores there that I would hope to be there? Um, and are new schools I'm expecting listed in the in the free school sheet? Uh, there's nothing I'm untoward there, nothing I'm, I'm not certain of what I wasn't expecting to happen. Another thing to check for is, is for the any outliers and baselines and pupil rates on your baseline sheet. So the baseline you'll be looking at will be a 21-22 baseline, not 2021. So apologies for that. Um, so you're looking at the baselines there that we've provided for you for the scores on your list. Um, and, and you can you can flag, look for specific error there to see if, if something's gone wrong. OK, so those are some of the simple validation things that, that are worth checking out and we'd, we'd like you to check out before you move on to the next stage. The next stage is the inputs and adjustments sheet. This is the main area for making changes for, for most of the changes you may need to make. There are, there are some LAs, sometimes not, not specific to an LA, but specific to any you know, it's one year or another year. Some years you may not need to make any input and adjustment changes. Um, but if you do, <laughs> this is the sheet where, you, where you're looking at making those changes. Um, and these cover a variety of different possible things. Um, uh, schools amalgamating, schools merging, um, new, new schools forming, um, schools closing. Um, so you can, you can, having reviewed your data in the schools block data set, and you know that some of these changes are therefore needed, this is where you'd come to make those changes. So you would go on to inputs and adjustments. There's a school listed on the school's book data. You know it's closing within the 
within uh, the financial year. We currently within 22, 23. So you need to do something about it. Um, and so this is where you'd be coming to do it. You pick the relevant what the problem is, if you like, from the left hand side of the inputs adjustments, where you've got a drop down list of different changes you can make here. Um, and then what will happen is once you select the category of, of the change you're about to make um, from the drop down list on, on the left hand column, uh, the cells that might need filling in are highlighted, and the cells that, that won't need filling in related to that change will be greyed out, try and help you focus on on what you need to uh, change. Um, sometimes cells are left highlighted um, because there's, it's possible you might need to change them, um, but you may not need to change them. So if you're making a school level change to a certain school, um, the different factor values might be left open to the possibility you could change them, but the vast majority of times you're not going to be changing those. But don't don't make any adjustment to them unless you actually intended to adjust them. So don't put zeros in, for example. Um, just leave them blank. Um, if you put a zero in, then we'll be classing it as a change. Um, some of the common changes people might make at this stage: um, the mobility of people number changes for specific schools. Um, we get changes to mobility is occurring less less often in the last couple of years uh, because of the change in definition of mobility over that time. But nevertheless, there are still some changes required to be made to mobility. Um, possible census errors. Um, a typical one is a census error sometimes throws up a primary age student in a secondary school. Um, so you've got a secondary school, which you know is a secondary school, but they've got one pupil in year five or something. Um, so we know that's a mistake, um, and you know that's a mistake as well. Um, and so you can take that out here and input some adjustments. Um, and one of the reasons why mobility sometimes gets changed is because academy conversion sometimes, I don't know if, it, I don't know if it's the class it gets recorded incorrectly, but the recording of the, 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 new, the new start of that school makes it look like the, the, the school's got a highly mobile population of pupils, when of course it isn't. They haven't moved and joined a school at the point that academy converted, they were already there. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why mobility sometimes needs, needs adjusting. Um, with all these changes and any changes you might make, whether it's in the inference adjustments or anywhere else within the APT, nearly every single line on the APT has a comment line, a comment cell associated with it, uh, enabling you to explain why you've made a change. And nearly all cases where we where a change is made, we would then also expect to see a comment explaining why you've made that change. Um, it doesn't have to be an essay. Um, if you can explain it fairly shortly, that, that's fine. Um, one of the validation checks I, I, I was talking about earlier um, is actually does, does do that. It, it, it looks at where somebody's made a change and it then looks to see if the comment cell is blank. And if the comment cell is blank but a change has been made, it will flag up as a validation error and say, well, you need to put something in here because you made a change. So you need to explain it to us. Uh, so some of the other more re reasons to make changes on inputs and adjustments, um, recent conversions. So there are conversions after census, basically. Um, amalgamating closing scores, I've already mentioned the idea of changing pupil numbers, I've already mentioned that as well. Changing pupil numbers, so why, why might that happen? Um, well, this section on changing pupil numbers is, is actually is for existing providers, so schools that already exist and, and are not, not necessarily new and growing. Um, you make this change on the inputs and adjustment sheet, um, it's usually something like a structural change, the common, re common reason, um, which doesn't need a desk allocation as long as the change is increasing those pupil numbers. Um, but again, a comment, although, although it might not be this application, a, a comment explaining what the change is about is going to be helpful. When making changes to pupil numbers, this is an area which is a bit complicated sometimes, can be confusing um, because of the funding, funding your financial year and the academic year conversion and maintain school, obviously funded by LAs from April to March, whereas an academy's funding year is obviously the academic year from September to August. And so when a conversion happens, you have to try to work out how that funding, how that 
factors should be applied across that uh, period. So commonly a conversion will convert in September. So when your its school population is it's a seven twelfth of, of a full year. In the various columns we're talking here, and these are these are to the to the far right on the on the, on the inputs adjustment sheet. Um, this is all about pupil number adjustments. Um, you need to indicate if there's a guaranteed status of those changes uh, in column BN. Um, a simple yes. Um, in column BP, if there's a more complicated change going on, so there's a change twice in a year, then you need to indicate that happens in that column. And then you'll probably need to talk to somebody as to how that should be represented and how we'll pick that up. Um, but you need to flag that up at that point uh, in a yes in that column. So when making changes to, to, to pupil numbers in, in this area, um, the, the, again, as, as with everything else, there's a, there's a comment section. Um, and this really needs to explain and confirm how you are making this, this change. Um, and in column BO, so you've got a commentary on what you're doing. Um, and there's a couple of examples there of what that commentary might represent. So we're adding an additional 30 pupils joining reception year in September 21. So the October 20 census of 300, which is what the figures were initially, but there's going to be this extra class, but it's only for 7 twelfths of the year. So it's the October 10th of 300 plus 7 twelfths of that new class of 30 should give you 317 and a half. And that's all but a comment explaining what your formula does um, or what your what, what the numbers are showing in, 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 the, in, in the other columns. Um, or the other example there, additionally guaranteed 30 pupils on top of the 13 guaranteed in the previous year. So you've got the previous year's 30 plus 7, 12, so another 30. Um, so you're making adjustments, but you're adjusting from the school's block data figure. Okay, and to make that clearer for you, uh, early, well, clearer for you, clearer for everyone trying to understand what's going on, we would ask that when you do, if you do this formula, formulaically within the cells, you do it by referring to the original data in the school spot data. So you can see here in the number and role section, you'd put, you could put in a formula that said it referred directly to the school spot data sheet. In this case, it happened to be the, the school that was in the data in, in uh, <coughs> row nine, big enough column M, the number of role. And then you're taking that source data and you're adding 30 times 7 twelfths because of the extra 30, but only for 7 twelfths a year. Um, and then you're making that reference to the school's spot data each time, rather than manually typing in the 300. Because if you manually type in the 300, we're then left with a position of someone's got to then check, and was the 300 correct in the first place? As if you make the link there to the original data in the school's box set, um, then that, that deals with it in its own way. Okay, and then after you've made that change, um, you then need to complete the column BSB, BSBT and BU to show what academic year total figures would be based on the previous change. Um, and there's, an, there's then to the right of those in columns BX, BY and CB, a, a, light, a, a lightened area which you've got, it's not, not editable, but essentially the figures you put in BSBT and BU should match with those figures, BX, BY and CB. And, and if you don't, it's a, this, is, this is here as an opportunity for you to, to see that they should match. And, and if you're getting different numbers, to make you think about why that is. Um, and if you're not sure, obviously, to get in touch with someone to work out what, what should be going on in there. Um, so it's, it, it, the, the BX, BY and CB figures are provided to, as, as a check for you to, to help you ensure that you've, you've inputted the figures correctly in the first place. Um, and in these samples where, because you're obviously, you, you may be using a formulae, 712, for example, of something, um, the def decimal places for those numbers on row are acceptable. So you don't need to round them. Uh, you don't need to round them to, to hold pupil numbers or anything like that. You can leave them in decimal places, and that's fine. Okay, and then for a new and growing school, you may need to apportion five twelfths of the existing year group, and then seven twelfths for the additional growing part there. For brand new providers, so which usually open in September, which means the whole allocation should reflect a part year allocation. Uh, you complete the inputs and adjustment sheet using the actual pupil numbers and flag. As it says there, remember to flag if these numbers are actually guaranteed. Use the provided fact data again from the school spot data. 
or your preferred equivalent if you've got a uh, justification for it, but obviously you need to explain what that uh, reason is. Most most cases it's going to be provided score spot data. Um, adjust the opening closing column on the local factor sheet. So now you're looking at a different sheet, not just the inputs and adjustments here. You go to the local factor sheet, you find the score you're talking about. Um, and in the column opening and closing, um, you, you need to make uh, that change there. Which, as this example says, most of the time it's going to be seven twelves. And that will then adjust all the formulaic elements because you will have kept them as the factors provided in the initial part. And then this will adjust them all, um, all the formulaic elements, including the lump sum. Um, and in school specific elements are then unchanged, such as PFI and rates and split sites. But new and growing schools have to be dealt with slightly differently. Uh, a definition of a new and growing school and the definition of new and growing schools they must have opened within the last seven years and that doesn't include becoming an academy so becoming an academy doesn't flag it as being a new school um, in this sense um, so the only way you can get flagged as new and growing is if you've only opened in within the last seven years um, and it doesn't have all of its year groups, groups populated okay and that doesn't necessarily mean full it just means populated so to be new and growing, open within the last seven years, and some of its year groups don't have pupils in them. But, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, that definition excludes those that are new because they're expanding age groups. So if you're an example, if you're an established secondary school and you're going to become an all through and open a primary phase, Assuming your secondary school has existed for more than seven years and has got pupils in all those years, then opening the primary phase doesn't make you a new and growing school. Okay, that's not classified as a new and growing school. And the similar sort of analogous example with the infant school there is an infant expanding to a full primary, so it has a junior element added on. Um, again, if the if the original school has been established for longer than seven years and has pupils in all the year groups then the fact that it's expanding to include a new phase does not make it new and growing. Okay, um, but then any providers meeting the criteria, so are, are open within the last seven years and don't have all their year groups populated, uh, get labelled as such in the local factor sheet, column P, new and growing school. A simple drop down of yes there, yes or no. And then this ensures the provider is not affected by affordability adjustments and receives all due funding through the formula as the lump sum proportion unwinds. High needs pupil numbers shown on local factor sheet and are used in the calculation of unoccupied unoccupied places in academies and reflected in DSG adjustments. Anything on the APT here is not used to a change allocated high needs places. Those are already done through the high needs centres. High needs place change review process in scope provided. So enter the number of pupils attracting high needs funding in the school census. And if it's less than the published place numbers, then the remainder are considered unoccupied. And if it's equal or more, then all places are occupied, occupied, and all are deducted from DSG at six thousand pounds. And additional five pupils are funded from local authority top up. And then we get to the DSG block transfer sheet. Now, the first thing to point out about this sheet is, of course, when you initially get it, there won't be any figures in it at all, including what your DSG is. As I said at the very beginning, um, the we normally send out the APT before the DSG has been uh, published and finalised, so we can't tell you what your DSG is at that point. So your DSG block transfer sheet requires you, once you know your DSG schools block award, to input that in that top left cell there, your DSG schools block, boom, goes in there. Then you look at this and you take it from the perspective of where other bit where, where transfers have occurred, have occurred to move it to other other blocks, um, and of course you, you, you again it's commentary there because if you're going to make a transfer to other blocks, you're going to need to justify that um, and probably need to get a disapplication or a permission a, agreement transfer agreement from TFE. Um, it, it depends exactly how much you're moving between blocks as to what level of agreement you need. 
um, whether it's schools forum, whether it's DFE, disapplication approval, things like that. Um, but this is where you record it um, on, the, on the block transfer sheet. It also gives you the opportunity here. We, we, want you, we, we ask you to record any transfers in. So if you've got reserves, previous reserves, or perhaps even an NHS contribution, um, then this is you put this in this part of the sheet as well to indicate you've got more money coming into your schools block from, from an outside source. And again, leads on for some explanation as to where that's come from. And I think that that, that sheet is proper as well as providing us with some information that we need uh, going forwards. I think is actually probably quite helpful for you guys as well in terms of just making it clear um, where you're spent and your transfers are going. And political ratification, Dames. Um, as you're probably all well aware, all allocations to maintain schools and a maintain schools have got to be distributed to schools by the 28th of February. Um, so if your council sign off is on that date, but there won't be an adjustment to school allocations at that point, then put in a date that your provider level allocations will actually have been signed off, presumably earlier in February. Um, so don't just put in the 28th of February because that's when the council sign off is if you already know that the school allocations are fixed. Um, then you can provide some other form of sign off for that and put that date in for earlier. Um, check your school's forum dates in January and February and, and ensure that they will allow changes, any changes that they highlight or request to be made before that deadline so that you can get your allocations made and also signed off. If there's school forum dates in March that you're waiting for, then it's going to be too late. Um, and the date for political ratification in March is going to be too late. So you need to consider those dates and to when, when, when that might happen for your formula. OK, well, thank you everybody for, for, for uh, attending. Um, I hope it's been helpful for you. Hopefully it was helpful for, for those who, who needed it. Thanks, everybody.